Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my amazing producer and co-host of the Model Health Show, the one and only Jade <laughs> Harrell. What's up, Jade? What's up, Sean? How are you today? Well, today I am Brazilian. Brazilian. Yes. I already like this. Sounds like Brazil. <laughs> it does, Brazil. right? Brazil. Can't go wrong there. So what does this mean? <laughs> that I am brilliantly resilient. I uh, feel brilliantly resilient. I like that. Yes. I like that. <laughs> resilient. Resi- yes. That's a powerful word in our lexicon, right? Yes. It's um, been embedded after hearing JJ Virgin and oh, you yeah. in that conversation. So, oh, man. Uh, I'm powerful. marching with that right now. Powerful. That's right. Expanding my comfort zone and... Um, Leaning into the fear and yeah. all those other things that come with it yeah. to become more resilient. I love it. Yeah. I love it. You know, yeah. kind of one of the closing lines when I did the the Cusp Conference in Chicago. Shout out to everybody in all Chicago. Right, all right. Uh, one of the kind of hallmark things. They actually took my talk and made a, a little bit of a montage. I love with it. it. I've always wanted to be a montage. You are ever since Rocky. Official. So, but one of the big takeaways was that. Our challenges are often our greatest teachers, Mm -hmm. you know, and I truly do believe that. And if we just change our perspective on these things, of course, it can be a little inflammatory in the moment, (laughs) right? Get your stuff out. Remember when we talked with Hal Elrod, for example, we talked about the five minute rule, Exactly. right? Go ahead and get your your frustration out. But now Mm -hmm. it's problem solving. Mm -hmm. Now we shift gears and look at how is this thing here to benefit me? So I loved he said that. that. He'd say, you can't change it. So only give it this much room. Yeah. And then go on. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I'm feeling. Well, I'm feeling pumped because we've got (laughs) a fantastic, fantastic episode for you guys. Uh And this guy has, like, dropped some serious gems in this new book. And we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things ever. Yeah. Hit. Okay, hit. H-I-I-T, High Intensity (laughs) Interval Training. (laughs) And uh, very excited. This guy is really the foremost expert on the subject matter. He's the guy in the lab doing the tests, telling you how this all works and the benefits that are coming from it. And incredibly excited to have him on. But first, let's give a quick shout out to our show sponsor, Onit.com. I see, I see you seeing the I'm flare right now. I'm checking it out. I'm like, that's a lot of people a don't know. O and a capital T on there. A, a lot of people don't know that they also have gear too, and they yeah. actually partnered with Marvel. Oh, cool! Yeah, they got some new series of Marvel T-shirts. That's what you have. They're on fantastic. Instagram. They also partnered with Cap- Capcom. Okay. I don't know for those people back in the day mm-hmm. who used to play Street Fighter. There you shout go. Shout out to Street Fighter. Right. Shout out to all oh, those those did. hours indoors as children. Instead yes. of playing outside, that's yes, right. that's right. <laughs> that's what I was doing as well. But I got outside too. That's right. Um, but so they got some awesome gear there. But the big thing that we so go cool. to them for is their mm-hmm. Earth Grown nutrients. Mm-hmm. They base their supplements on Earth Grown nutrients. The Hemp Force protein, quite possibly the most bioavailable protein mm-hmm. for the human body, is going to be found in hemp. The albumin, very mm-hmm. soft globular mm-hmm. protein, very digestible. Uh, edestin, mm-hmm. which is unique to hemp, really phenomenal uh, in its benefits and something that if you haven't heard about this before please understand with proteins it's not just the fact that it's there it's how digestible is it right so can can your body actually utilize it (laughs) right right? it's like there's seventeen thousand grams of protein in this uh weight gain five thousand shake but can your body actually use it you'll see like three are you going to open up like a volcano (laughs) right so check out the hemp force protein (laughs) check out their mct oil some of my favorite Mm -hmm. things definitely had some this morning with Mm -hmm. my morning elixir what did you have i had some uh lion's mane tea (laughs) along with strawberry emulsified MCT mm-hmm, oil. Mm-hmm. All right, so head over there, check them out, onit.com oh, forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash M-O-D-E-L for 10% off. Now, let's get to the iTunes review of the week. This is a great one. It says, Game Changer, five stars. Sean's experience and knowledge are game changers. There appears to be no bounds in the amount of valuable information this show provides. Never have I felt more in control or motivated to take care of my body in my early 30s, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and the diagnosis came after suffering through several pregnancy losses. I was left feeling defeated, confused, and uncomfortable in my own skin. This continued for several years. The moment I discovered the Model Health Show, those feelings disappeared. Sean and his guests share information that can benefit the healthiest of people to those like me who are just climbing out of that deep hole of hopelessness. Mm. I find myself laughing out loud at the pop culture references and the shout outs. Being a superhero is attainable thanks to the knowledge I have accrued in the short time I've listened to the show. After all, knowledge is power. Keep it up. 
with a fist bump emoji. Sean, thank you for being you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. That is so powerful. I appreciate you sharing that. For sure. And thank you for taking the time to leave that review for us on iTunes. And everybody, thank you for leaving these reviews on iTunes. It really does provide some fuel <laughs> yeah, for does. this fire and uh, keep them coming. Fire. And on that note, let's get to our mm -hmm. special guest. And today's guest is Martin Gabala, Ph.D., and he is a professor and chair of the kinesiology department at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Shout out to our friends in, Canada. in the great north up there. Yes. Uh, his research on the uh, physiological and health benefits of high-intensity interval training has attracted immense scientific attention and worldwide media coverage. Uh, Gabala is published in more than 100 peer-reviewed articles. All right, So when you guys are going to PubMed and like looking for research stuff, he's popping up. All right, Thanks to him. The, re the results of which have been featured in outlets including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, CNN, uh, NBC, and even Conan, one of my favorite shows. A little fun fact about Sean. He is frequently invited to speak at international scientific meetings and has received multiple awards for teaching excellence. And I'd like to welcome yes. to the Model Health Show the one and only Dr. Martin Gibala. How you doing today, man? Hey, Sean. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. It's my <laughs> pleasure. It's my pleasure. Very excited to have you on. I told you your book is absolutely phenomenal this this book is so good it doesn't even make any sense actually <laughs> <laughs> and but before we get to any of that stuff and start talking about the hit training i love to know a little bit of your backstory you know so what got you interested in the whole field of science and health in the first place yeah like a lot of people who come into kinesiology or exercise science uh, i was an athlete uh, the caliber is up for others to uh, to decide but uh, <laughs> i think that's why a lot of people get interested in that certainly that was the reason uh, i was i almost went to architecture school and sort of made a, a left turn right at the last minute when i was in school i physiology or how the body works really appealed to me and so it was a way to sort of combine an interest in sport and exercise, uh, a growing interest in health with really wanting to understand some of the mechanisms of, of how the body works. So it, it started with, you know, what can I learn about physiology that might help my own athletic performance? And then it really just uh, grew from there. Wow. Yeah. Which you still are kind of like an architect, actually. I was you know, say that's that. such that's a, a cool piece. story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but and you're so right. That's what leads a lot of us into this field is mm -hmm. athletics mm -hmm. and having that kind of um, endeav endeavors. Uh, and that fire under us to be an athlete, to perform, right. to compete, right. and having that interest it evolves into science mm -hmm. and the human body mm -hmm. and nutrition, all that good stuff. But It's a culture, yeah. too. And your recent focus in your career has actually been on the pretty remarkable benefits of interval training. And it's a new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. but it's been repeatedly overlooked. Can you share first what interval training actually means and also share a little bit of the history of interval training. Sure. Interval training is really just alternating periods of relatively intense exercise with periods of recovery. That can be rest or just lower intensity exercise. So this notion of hills and valleys. As you say, it's been around for at least a century. The the more I learn about inter interval training, uh, the more I appreciate both the athletic and the scientific history. Uh, the athletic History goes back to the flying Finns at the turn of the century who were winning middle distance races in the Olympics. Uh, Roger Bannister, uh, when he was making the assault on the four minute mile, was a very busy medical student and employed interval training on his lunch hour uh, because he didn't have much time to, to exercise. The scientific history goes back to at least the, the 1950s. There's some really interesting German research. And then over time, it sort of, it, it pops up. Uh, there was an individual named Ed Fox who did some work at Ohio State University. Uh, of course, Tabata-style training uh, became very popular in the 90s, and our work sort of took off around uh, 2005. I love that. Let's it's talk about timeline. Roger Bannister for a minute. <laughs> you know, like, it's such a phenomenal story because prior to him cracking the four-minute mile, it was believed that the human body couldn't even do that. And for you to show, and I didn't know this until I read your book, to shine that light that he was utilizing interval training. He wasn't just out there just running straight miles, you right, know, just right. putting in miles. I'm just going to go and run a mile for my training. Mm -hmm. No, he was actually doing these sprint intervals, and it created this huge capacity in him to perform and to crack that. Uh, right, like He'd, like, destroy the record. Okay, right, and now, right. like, even high, high school kids See? are cracking that uh, yeah. four-minute mile yeah. because it Amazing. changes our paradigm mm -hmm. of what's possible. But I'm so grateful that you put this into the book. There's a new barrier, if you will, and that's the two-hour marathon. There's a lot of interesting research right now. There's a lot of initiatives uh, around the idea of, of a sub-two, 
Uh, and so I think this attempt to break sub two, whether in, anyone's eventually able to do it, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it was probably very similar at the time to this magical four minute uh, mark. But point being, if you know, we, we get a lot of attention now for our research, but we, we really do try to give a nod to history and, and highlight the fact that both scientifically and certainly coaches and athletes have, have known a lot of this stuff for, for a long time. I think the most interesting thing of interval training research recently are, are two things. One, uh, it can come in many different varieties. I'm sure we'll get into this and be applied to, to many different individuals. It, it's not only for highly trained individuals. Uh, and the second is just the surprisingly small dose of exercise that you can seemingly get away with yeah. uh, mm -hmm. if it's of a very intense nature. Again, that's not to mean it's the way that everyone should train, but if you're particularly time pressed, uh, going hard uh, appears to be the way to go. Yeah, and your book shows unequivocally that this is true. And I'd love for you to share uh, some of what you found in your studies, especially your early studies. So let's talk about one of your earlier uh, research studies on wind gates and what you were able to discover from that. Yeah, and a wind gate, I'm sure many of your listeners are aware, some may not be, but it's basically a 30 second all out effort on a bike. It's about as uncomfortable an exercise as, as you can imagine, a bit like riding uphill through sand. So it's very demanding exercise, but it's a very commonly measured test of capacity in exercise physiology. And so our initial studies uh, just used a couple of wind gates. So 30 seconds of effort, a few minutes of recovery, repeated four or five times. And our, 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 our initial study that really attracted a lot of attention, we had people do six of those training sessions over two weeks. And remarkably, we found a, a doubling of endurance capacity. And we could back that up with measurements that we made from muscle biopsies showing that something called their mitochondrial content, or this is the component of the cell that uses oxygen to burn sugars and fats to produce energy. Uh, there was a large increase in mitochondrial content mm. to what you would typically see with many weeks of traditional endurance exercise. So that really was a, a stunning result for me and sort of set us on the path uh, to where we are now. Wow. I hope everybody heard that. Mm -hmm. We literally can radically increase your mitochondrial creation, like the creation of mitochondria by utilizing HIIT training. We've talked about this numerous times on the show. Mitochondria kind of like your energy nuclear power plants, yeah. right? They're creating this, they're the storehouse that's making the energy that you experience. Mm -hmm. It's so phenomenal that we can utilize something like this. And he said it too, he put it up against traditional cardio as well. So people were able, people were able to get these results in just a fraction of the time <laughs> versus spending so much time, you know, out there on the roads or on the trails or mm -hmm. on the, the cardio equipment. And it's, there's a lot of memes out there about being on the <laughs> treadmill. There's one of them is sort of like, um, uh, if you think that, uh, a minute is a long time. You've never been on a treadmill, that kind of thing, you know. And then also, you know, you're, you set that. the things. You're like, I'm going, I'm going to do 45 minutes of cardio. Yeah. An hour goes by, and I look at my watch, and it's actually been two minutes. Exactly. All right? Exactly. It's, it just kind of messes with mm -hmm. your head, you know. Mm -hmm. But some people love that, mm -hmm. and more power to you. I have to put a towel over the display <laughs> to keep myself from. I don't looking. see you. Oh my gosh! And it's, times the I, display is a butterface. Yeah. yeah. I have Everything to just is get good, butterface. Butterface. Butter now, in preparation for this episode today, because I've I've been doing hit training on the track, you know, utilizing sprints, full sure. sprints. But I hopped back on the bike. This was probably the first way that I ever did it. And I got in there, and like you said, it's grueling, man. I got in there, and I did it. And I essentially did the wind gates with a little bit less time in between, more like two two minutes uh, uh, between. But I'm glad that you brought this up because uh, looking at the mechanisms behind the change is really important. But can you give us a little bit more insight into the comparison with traditional cardio and what we're going to be able to get with HIIT training? Our most recent study, and this is where it starts to verge into infomercial type, uh, but it's <laughs> we demonstrated in the lab scientifically. Uh, our interval protocol now and where the title of the book comes from, the one minute workout, uh, it's a bit of a teaser headline, but it really relates to the fact that the hard work is three 20 second all out efforts. So we'd have people do a short warm up, a 20 second all out sprint, recover for two minutes, a second 20 second sprint, another two minute recovery, and then that third and final 20 second sprint and a short cool down. So the sprint group was doing 10 minutes of total time commitment three times a week. And we compared that to a group that was doing basically what you'd see in the public health guidelines. So 150 minutes per week of continuous uh, traditional steady state cardio. So big differences between the two groups. 
30 minutes involving only one minute of high intensity exercise versus 150 minutes wow. a week of traditional cardio. And over 12 weeks, so three months of training, the improvement that we saw in fitness, so their measured VO2 max, which is a really important measure for health, uh, it, it links to your risk of dying from all causes, the increase in fitness was the same in the two groups. Uh, we measured that mitochondrial content that we were talking about earlier, same increase in mitochondrial content. Unbelievable. And we also measured something called insulin sensitivity. I know you're familiar with that term, but it's basically a, a measure of how the body processes and handles blood sugar. It's important for your risk for diabetes. And we found that the increase in insulin sensitivity, again, on average, uh, was the same in the two groups. So just a dramatic uh, illustration, I think, of the potency of this type of training. This would be difficult, seriously difficult to wrap my mind around if I didn't see the studies behind it. Because you're literally saying one minute of hard exercise equated to 150 mm -hmm. minutes mm -hmm. of traditional, quote, cardio exercise. That is absolutely mm -hmm. mind blowing. And this is just looking at what are the things that we can utilize as human beings to be more efficient and effective yeah. as human beings? Because the human body is all about efficiency. Mm -hmm. It's always looking for ways that it can adapt fast right. to its stimuli. So speaking of that, <laughs> uh, with these different mechanisms behind the scene, you mentioned VO2 max. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So VO2 max is a measure of the maximum rate at which the body can use oxygen. So we would have people on a, on a bike or a treadmill, they do a progressive test, uh, and it's the highest rate at which the body can use oxygen. It's related to the ability of the heart, the lungs, the blood vessels to deliver oxygen, and the ability of the muscles to use the oxygen as well. It's critical for athletic success and endurance events. So it's a, it's a necessary but not sufficient component. If you wanna be an elite endurance athlete, you need to have a high VO2 max but it's also critical uh, for health. Uh, it's one of the best overall markers of your health. And there's been a, a recently a, a lot of attention around the fact that perhaps cardiorespiratory fitness or VO2 max should be uh, a vital sign, just like blood pressure mm. or body weight or body composition or, or blood sugar levels. The problem, of course, it's, it's challenging to measure, certainly not something that can be routinely done in a doctor's office because it, it resembles an exercise stress test. But at least there's some pretty good online calculators where people can get a sense of what their fitness might be and how that might trend over time, either up or down. Fantastic. Nice. No, you've got this really fascinating uh, graph here in the book because conventional thinking is that, you know, when you're doing this kind of hard exercise, just for a short amount of time, you're not really getting that, quote, cardio benefit, right? And you show in the book that it does start off anaerobic, and then it quickly changes to a very intense and strong aerobic form of exercise. So can you talk about that, the anaerobic aerobic difference, and maybe even talk a little bit about the muscle fiber recruitment? Sure. You know, it would surprise a lot of people, I think. Even my students, when you know, fourth year kinesiology students, when I, when I teach my upper level course, uh, I'll show the energy pattern or distribution over a 30 second wind gate test. And again, this is like riding up a hill made of sand. It's, it's challenging, challenging exercise. And during the last half of that 30 second effort, most of the energy is coming from the aerobic system. Mm -hmm. And if you do repeated sprints, which is characteristic of most team sports, for example, most of the energy is coming from aerobic metabolism. So when you think of it that way, perhaps it's not surprising that we have adaptations in the aerobic energy supply system. And that underlies or explains some of these aerobic adaptations that we see because uh, myself, colleagues, other labs around the world have demonstrated evidence that your heart becomes a better, stronger pump. Your blood vessels get more elastic and that allows the blood and oxygen to flow easier and your muscles get better at using uh, the oxygen. Even at the molecular and cellular level, we can see evidence of this inside the muscle. They become more resilient. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we did an entire show dedicated to HIIT training back in the day. This was maybe even a year ago, but more so in, the, in that particular episode, I focused on um, strategies for it, you know, and like from, from battle ropes to kettlebell swings to whatever the different methods are. And you've actually in the book, we'll get to this in a second, pin down what the best forms are. Like, how can you get the most from this? But I also talked about the muscle fibers on, on that show. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. But can you talk a little bit about that? Because again, it's this uh, schism that we have <laughs> in our minds that, you know, this is for one thing, this is for another thing. Strength training is for this. Uh, running is for this mm -hmm. and for that. how are, how are we able to uh, basically utilize 
more of our muscle fibers by doing HIIT training. You're right. I think the the higher the intensity, the greater what we call the recruitment of muscle fibers. And so for some individuals, if you only do uh, low, even moderate intensity exercise, there's a pool of muscle fibers that largely remains dormant. They just sort of go along for the ride. Yeah. You don't call on them at all. And if we don't challenge those muscle fibers, Again, what we see over time, especially with aging, we can see some loss of type two muscle fibers or we get atrophy of these muscle fibers. So we really need to challenge them. And one of the ways that we can challenge them is through higher intensity exercise. So we push these fibers, we recruit these fibers and they remodel and adapt just like other uh, slow twitch or um, those smaller muscle fibers that are more routinely used for activities of daily living. So as corny as it sounds, it is a bit of you know, uh, if you don't use it, you'll you'll lose it uh, quite quite literally. Right. Wow, right. that's like hashtag classic right there. <laughs> yeah. And in this, so we'll put that in the show notes. Okay. And so we talk about that transition from the slow twitch fibers mm-hmm. to the fast twitch fibers, and then more recently discovered there's these intermediate fibers as well. And so you're able to recruit all of your potential wow. by utilizing this form of exercise. So I love it. Yeah. Question. Well, beyond the realm of getting fit. I'm sure there's other great health benefits to this training. Can you talk more about that, like for diabetes, heart disease and such? Yes. uh, I I mentioned insulin sensitivity earlier, and that is a really uh, big adaptation that we see with interval training. And, you know, uh, we... The one minute workout, a bit of the teaser headline, clearly very short, very vigorous bursts of exercise can be extremely time efficient, but there's many different flavors of interval training. And so there's more gentle forms of interval training. Uh, There was a study out of uh, Denmark uh, that compared interval walking compared to just steady state walking Mm. in people who have type 2 diabetes. And so the total amount of exercise these people did was the same, but one group just sort of picked up the pace a little bit, almost for a few light posts and then backed off. So just gentle interval walking, even though the average heart rate for the two training groups was the same, the interval walkers at the end of the study became more fit, Mm. had an improved blood sugar profile, and even the changes in their body composition were superior to the continuous steady state walking group. So again, just uh, um, to convey that gentle forms of interval training can be effective. Uh, and there's a type of interval training, I think, that's suited for, for almost anyone. Sure. That provides that. a lot of hope for those that may have thought that HIT training was for high intensity athletes or performers. But the fact that there is a version and, a, and an adaptation for almost anyone, they can also greatly increase their benefit. Yeah. Provides a, a, a good deal of hope. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the book, we, you know, we give 12 different examples of interval workouts. Uh, they're all based on science. So someone could look at all of those workouts and know that there's been a scientific study that demonstrated the benefit. And we take it right from the beginner, which is just that gentle interval walking right up to these more extreme types of, of yeah. training. And it's just to give 12 examples because one of the beauties of interval training, as you will well know, Sean, is that it's infinitely variable. You alluded to it earlier. There's you know, nothing wrong with traditional steady state cardio where we are not at all taking shots at the public health guidelines because mm-hmm. they're based on very good science. But there's only so many ways to jump on a treadmill and jog at a moderate pace for 45 minutes or an hour. But with interval training, you can vary up the the intensity, the pace, the recovery periods, uh, active versus passive recovery. And really, it's about providing more menu choices to people, more Uh, exercise options, because we know adherence to the current guidelines are poor. And so if we can provide some people with options that are grounded in good good science, that's a that's a good strategy in our minds. I love that menu options, right? That we (laughs) like options, right? And so that's that's really the key here. And also for those people, it's just like, you know, when we talk about doing an hour of cardio, just like, I don't have that kind of time, bro. (laughs) You know, I just don't have that kind of time. And so this is giving us a very powerful uh, in. This is giving us a a bridge, a connection to being more fit, to being more healthy Mm -hmm. in a much shorter time window. And that's Mm -hmm. fascinating to be able to leverage again. We've got a a finite amount of time here on this planet. What can we do to become the best version of ourselves? And this is part of it. So that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about what are those best forms? Mm-hmm. Uh, and some, also some personal questions I want to ask as well. <laughs> but also um, looking at when to do this, right. how frequently. Frequency. And we're going to talk about that right after this quick break. Hold on a second and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. With all of the things that we're exposed to today, the environmental toxicity, the weird stuff showing up in our food supply, we've got to do things 
to really support our immune system. Our immune system is really running the show on so many different levels to keep us healthy. And one of the most powerful things for supporting a healthy immune system is making sure that we're getting in some immunomodulators. So what does that mean? These are substances that can help to elevate our immune system in response to things that might be trying to creep their way into our body, into our cells, and defend us against those things. But it can also bring the immune system back down, calm it down if things are running too hot, a.k.a. we're dealing with some autoimmunity. We need things that are intelligent. Many drugs out there that are pushed through pharmaceutical companies, though they mean well, they push your immune system in one direction, and that can really mess things up on the back end, you know, leading to AKA side effects. So to avoid that, getting some natural immunoregulators are going to be a powerful thing you add into your life. How I do that, and it's been a consistent basis pretty much every single day. For the past three months now, I've been using every day, and even had it this morning, the incredible mushroom elixirs from Four Sigmatic. So head over to foursigmatic.com forward slash model. So that's F-O-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash model. And you're going to get 10% off all these amazing superfood elixirs. My favorite is the chaga. And chaga has been clinically shown to increase your NK cell activity. So your natural killer cells over 300%. It's also the most powerful antioxidant that we've ever seen in the history of humanity that humans actually consume. Powerful antioxidant, powerful anti-cancer, powerful immune system regulator. So that's what I use in the morning. I'll get some chaga and sometimes I'll have it straight or I'll blend it with some you know, hot water, some healthy fat. So this could be some ghee, this could be some grass-fed butter, this could be some coconut oil, some MCT oil, things like that. With a little bit of cinnamon, maybe some other fun medicinal herbs you can throw in there. But this has been the daily thing that I've done for the past few months. And I highly recommend you start doing the same thing. They also have the mushroom coffees, and my wife is a big fan of these. And so the mushroom coffee mix has cordyceps and chaga in there. And today she ran out. She was like, where's my, where's my coffee? You know, and she's not even, ever since we've been together, she hasn't been a coffee drinker. But this has been her daily thing. She loves the way it makes her feel. And she doesn't get some weird kind of caffeine spike and crash as well. So head over and check them out. Foursigmatic.com forward slash model for 10% off. Now back to the show. All right, we are back, and we are talking with the one and only Dr. Martin Gabala about his fascinating research and his brand new book as well, The One Minute Workout. Mm-hmm. And he was like, this is so, it's, it's the flashy part. I'm not trying to just, but that's important. I love that you, and somebody probably had you to like pull you in, like you've got to say this because that's what draws people in. Like, okay, one minute, I can do that. Mm. And you showed the effects, and you talked about this before the break, that one minute of hard exercise in these structured intervals was equivalent to doing, you know, 150 minutes of traditional cardio wow. from it, from its change for your VO2 max, from its shifts with your uh, mitochondrial production. It's absolutely fascinating. So Exponential. Um, what I want to ask you about mm-hmm. next is let's talk a little bit about structure here. So my first question is what about frequency? You know, what is the minimum effective dose to start to see some <laughs> benefits here? Like, should we be doing this once a week or right. kind of, you know, what is the ideal optimal way for people who are, you know, uh, in, in their teens up to their, you know, uh, mid fifties even for getting the most benefit from interval training, maybe three times a week. What, what is, what does the science say for us? Yeah, that's a loaded question and a lot of different <laughs> ways to answer it. Uh, what I can say is in our studies and most studies, um, interval training is performed three times a week. And so, Uh, We know that doing intervals three times a week can be extremely effective to elicit a lot of those adaptations that we were talking about earlier in the show. Uh, We also know that even a single weekly bout of high intensity exercise can be effective for lowering your risk of dying from all causes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's often you'll see high profile newspaper reports uh, up here in Canada. It might be that individual who played ice hockey on the weekend uh, with his buddies. And occasionally there'll be, uh, someone will suffer a cardiac event, a heart attack. Uh, but if you look at the science, uh, it would suggest that doing that one weekly bout of high intensity exercise is going to confer benefits as compared to just remaining sedentary or doing nothing at all. So it gets back to this idea that doing something is better than nothing. When it comes to optimal, 
it really depends why someone's getting into an exercise training program. Yes. Is it about trying to manage body weight or blood sugar? Is it about cardio health? Is it about performance? Uh, what age are they? Uh, are they someone like me with a bum knee, you know, who can't do interval training on a track? Uh, so you want to do more uh, interval training on a bike or less uh, weight bearing type exercise. So the devil's really in the details there. But I think three times a week is is more than uh, sufficient. And the other idea is that a varied approach to fitness is always best. As I said, nothing wrong with traditional moderate intensity uh, cardio. Some people like just going for a jog with their uh, with their partner uh, or, or a friend. Uh, incorporating some sort of body weight style interval training is effective as well. And so I think that's an important point about interval training. You can do it in a traditional cardio style manner, but you can also incorporate body weight style training. And that almost provides um, great bang for your buck because yeah. it's a sort of middle ground with inner body weight style intervals, almost classic Tabata style training. You can definitely get the fitness boost, but you can get a strength boost as well out of it. So when you're really time pressed, I call it hotel room workouts, <laughs> yeah. you know, where you're doing some burpees, maybe get outside, do the stairs a little bit, some mountain climbers. It can be a really effective way to maintain fitness, especially on the road. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I've been sharing a lot <laughs> of posts over the past couple of years, especially the most uh, this past year. For me, working out in a hotel. Yeah. And I tend to find, you know, a little bit nice hotels that have some some good gyms. But sometimes you just got to do, do what you can with what you've got, mm -hmm. you know. And there's so many different opportunities, especially when you utilize HIIT training. It's one of my favorite times to do it and to take advantage of it is when I'm on the road to get, again, more bang for the buck mm -hmm. because I generally got a lot of stuff going on. And so for me personally, I'll just share this. Yeah. I generally do HIIT training once to twice a week. And I've been doing that for quite a long time now, probably for about the last year. Mm -hmm. And I've done so many different strategies, of course. <laughs> I'm always experimenting, but just kind of settling into what I like now at this point in my life, rather than finding out what this thing is going to do so right. I could tell a million people about it, you know. But for, so for me, I love the, you know, powerlifting, you know. So there's a day that I've got dedicated to doing heavy deadlifts, heavy squats and those kind of things. And so mixing it all in and having my own strategy, because for me, it's the, it's the fitness, it's the build, mm -hmm. and it's the overall health, right. you know. But for other people, it might be something different, a different formula. And so that's my question for you. If people are wanting to, you know, add this HIIT training into their regimen, they're already like, they're, they're meathead, all right? They're just like full-on meathead. I'm part of the club, all right? I could definitely join the meathead club, and I can also probably join the, um, uh, be a mathlete as well. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, so and they want to add this in, would it be ideal to do, if we're going to add the HIIT training into their already existing format, to do the HIIT training before they strength train? On a, Just say they have to do it that day. Before they strength train or after they strength train? I'd say after. Uh, I think, um, you know, and again, you're going to get lots of different opinions on that one, yeah. but I, I would suggest after, and that's in order to to maximize the hypertrophy stimulus of the, the strength training uh, early on. But I would also say, do what works for you. You know, we can sit here and say, if you exercise in the morning after an overnight fast, you're going to burn a little bit more calories from fat. And you're someone who just hates exercising in the morning, or you always want to have breakfast. That's not a very good message for you. Yeah. So the number one message would be try and incorporate it, do it in a way that works for you. But if I would, I was pushed, I would say, do your resistance training first and follow it up with some intervals after that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's generally what I do is one day is dedicated to HIIT training specifically. Another day I'll add it in after I lift. Okay. You know, so. For that, uh, for that second day. But it's fine to do all the other types of things. So we mentioned three times a week mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a great measure or goal. So in between, does it matter what else you do on the other days? How can it complement? Yeah, or you know, it, it, it really comes down to if, if, if it's about time efficiency, mm -hmm. then a lot of people aren't doing much in, in between those days. Obviously, more do. frequent exercise, more days of the week is good. But if we just, again, look at those adherence numbers, yeah. uh, it's not very good yeah. <laughs> in terms of what people are actually doing. So I think three times per week of exercise uh, at a minimum uh, is, is a good strategy. And again, Sean, going back to some of the things that you were saying, those don't all have to be interval uh, training workouts. I think if people can just get moving three times a week. Yeah. It's great. The other thing about interval training that we like to say is it provides a good way to fit exercise within your life rather than having to structure your life around exercise. Just going back to that idea of insulin sensitivity, um, there's this concept of exercise snacking 
where these short <laughs> bouts of exercise spread through the day and emerging evidence that that might be a better way to go. So for example, doing three 10 minute bouts of exercise in terms of the improvement in your blood sugar might be better than a single 30 minute bout of continuous exercise. So again, breaking it up through the day, uh, it looks like it's more effective and also it's an easier way to fit that exercise into your life because a lot of people, if they don't have 45 minutes or an hour, they tend to blow it off. And so a big yeah. message is no, even if you got 10 or 15 minutes, get something in. Love that. And you actually do <laughs> have uh, a study that affirms that in the book. And so that's really what it is in the overall story that I'm, I'm hearing here, which is so refreshing is that this depends on you. You know, there's a lot of different flavors that you can choose from on the menu. There's snacks you could take from the menu. You know, the important thing is that you have an entire menu. You know, we like to eat. So now we got to like to exercise a little bit more and by like understanding, choices. getting ourselves out of that prison in our minds that I, I have to have an hour mm -hmm. to work out. That's my, um, that's my barrier to entry. No longer. Right. That story right. is over. So let's talk a little bit about um, people with this mentality uh, coming into it about safety and fear, you know, about. And so there's, it just stretches all the way from basic fear of like, you know, I haven't really moved this body that fast in 20 years, you know, like, are you sure that my, my butt isn't going to like knock the person next to me off of their bike? You know, like I got to be careful of all this moving, all this goodness. So that's one side. And then the other side is, um, just a, even, a a concern about their level of fitness to be able to embark on this, uh, hit training. Yeah. It's an important question. Um, anyone starting or changing their exercise routine really should see their physician to be cleared to make sure that they're, um, there's no underlying uh, silent risk factors that might be able to be identified. So, you know, let's get that general advice out of the way from the outset that you really should see your doctor if you're going to start or change an exercise routine. That being said, interval training in many different formats has been widely applied, scientifically studied in people with metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, obesity, and shown benefits. So I, it comes back to this idea, I think, that there's an interval training approach uh, for, for almost anyone. And if you go back even to some classic research uh, out of Germany in the mid-1980s where they were starting to apply interval training to people in a cardiac rehabilitation setting. So these are individuals who had had a heart attack and were going into structured exercise some of these people, it's difficult for them to maintain exercise for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. And so they have to exercise in an interval fashion because it's quite tiring. So they push themselves a little bit and then they stop, take a break and they go again. And, and now uh, interval training is uh, applied in, in many cardiac rehab uh, centers uh, around the world. So I think the bottom line is there's a type of interval training that's appropriate for almost anyone. Sure, there's certain individuals that should not be doing interval training, and those can be identified, hopefully, uh, through some medical uh, screening. Um, but again, I would come back to this message. If it's going to be a choice between sitting on the couch all day, remaining sedentary, or doing interval training, uh, I think the advice is clear that interval training is, is going to be better. Uh, but a varied approach to fitness is the best one overall and something that works for you. Perfect, awesome. perfect. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, like you just mentioned, it's an extreme minority of people who this would not be ideal to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so just keep that in mind. And so let's talk about the approach to actually doing uh, HIT all right, or the interval training. So what do we need to do to get ready for this? Um, obviously, people are not just going to roll out of bed and go sprint down the street. You know, so what are what are some of the ways that we can uh, that you recommend for us to get ready to, to do HIT? If, you know, if you're going to keep the time efficiency aspect, you need to keep warmups relatively short and cool down short as, as well. So in our studies, even when we've been doing studies on people with type 2 diabetes, uh, the warmups tend to be quite short, a couple of minutes of, of lower intensity exercise of the type of work that they're going to be engaged in. So right. it might be recumbent cycling, the, the seated cycling rather than upright uh, cycling. And in the book, we introduce workouts that are, are really only a couple of minutes. Uh, and then a cool down that's a couple of minutes as well. It's really just um, war literally warming up the body a little bit, getting the blood flowing, uh, but then getting into uh, the workout. Because again, if if the issue is time efficiency, uh, that's that's quite critical. You can't have a 15 or 20 minute uh, warm up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's again, just and this is before I read your book, before we met, which is um, it's so powerful to have this affirmative uh, voice here, but you know, I'll warm up on the bike. If I'm going to do sprints on the bike for, you know, two to three minutes, then I'm getting into my intervals. If I'm on the track, uh, because I'm doing 
warming up doing the thing I'm going to do. So mm -hmm. I'm going to warm up by jogging, right. you know, and I think that's a really great thing that we can carry into all of our different training. I think if we're going to be doing squats, doing some body weight squats is a great warm up and doing squats just with the bar, you know, doing a couple of sets to get your body to, to wake up and understand, okay, we're about to do this movement. You know, so just this a little extra, little like uh, a little snack, I since like we're using the word that. snack today, to put out there for us to utilize. Yeah. But uh, now let's talk about the best, mm -hmm. what are the best ways that we can utilize HIT. Um, there, we've covered, like, we talked about briefly Wingates, Tabata, mm -hmm. but from your perspective, what are a few of the best ways for us to take advantage of this? One of our favorites is called the 10 by 1. Uh, which is basically one minute of relatively hard exercise, so maybe a seven or eight on a 10-point scale, not going all out, uh, followed by a minute of recovery, repeated 10 times. So it's it's easy to conceptualize, uh, one minute hard, one minute easy, repeated 10 times. Uh, and I like that workout because it's still relatively time efficient, uh, and it's been one of the most widely studied protocols in our lab and others. It It's one of those protocols that have been applied to people with cardiovascular disease in a cardiac rehab setting. Uh, it's been applied to diabetics, and it's also been applied to uh, young, fit, healthy men and shown benefits uh, in all of them. So it's it's a good scientifically validated protocol, uh, and it's sort of in the middle there in terms of not super long um, and not all out maximal either. Uh, and in that cardiac rehab um, study that I alluded to, just through informally talking to some of the participants, uh, my colleagues found that uh, that was a workout that they subjectively uh, preferred as well. Awesome. So we've got that one in the bank. Mm -hmm. What about... What's an example of the one minute and then the down that you that you do? I like the one minute workout. Uh, it's mainly been studied on the bike, but we recently published a study uh, that showed stair climbing was just as effective. You know, a lot of us work in office towers, live in apartment complexes, and so you can apply the one minute workout by doing three 20 second bouts of stair climbing. So that's maybe four or five flights of stairs for an average individual or about 60 stairs. You know, you climb 60 stairs three times and just take a little bit of recovery in between. And that's a really effective and practical application of the one minute workout. And if you do it for six weeks, you're going to boost your cardiorespiratory fitness, that VO2 max value that we talked about, uh, by an amount that uh, has been associated with about a 13% uh, lower risk of dying from all causes. Ka-ching! Yeah, Love so it. In the book, you've got uh, the 10 by 1, the Wingate Classic, the Fat Burner. That one sounds really appealing. Mm -hmm. um, so can we, let's cover one more that we can share with everybody. What is the fat burner? Uh, the fat burner is based on some research out of Australia where they did a lot of very short uh, interval uh, repeats. So we're talking about eight seconds or so with about 12 seconds of recovery, but repeated about 60 times. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, 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 it that adds up a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but it it's a way to go short, hard bursts. Uh, and and repeat them. So again, what you're seeing here is just different flavors uh, on on a theme. Right. And all of these burn fat, by the way. That's just got the fancy name. But I think that some of these are are you know possibly possibly even more effective. Uh, and I think there's a, also a, a important point there for recovery time as well. In, actually, doing the interval so that you can come back at it as hard as you can. For my own experience, and also the recovery time in between hit workouts. And like he said, he recommends three times a week. Um, but for, so personally, just throw this out there. I've, I generally do a 30 second sprint on the bike when I use the bike and then 90 second recovery, or I'll do 20 second sprints with 40 second recovery. So every minute is a kind of a, a repetition for me. And those are kind of the ways that I generally like to do it. And when I'm on the track, I, my favorite thing is to do uh, 100 meter sprint repeats. So I'll go all out on the sprint and my recovery time is walking back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. And I will take my time walking <laughs> too. All right. And then I'll get back and I'll put all of my effort into it. Generally, we're doing somewhere in the realm of, you know, five to eight sprints in that day. And wow, it's incredibly effective. I mean, the results speak for themselves. And uh, so you sprint the full quarter mile? No, 100 meters. 100 meters. 100 okay, meters. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so this has been phenomenal. Phenomenal. And I'm so grateful that you put the time and energy into writing this book. And uh, before I let you go, I've got one final question for you that I like to ask my guests. And I'm curious to hear your answer. So uh, with the work that you've put in, with the way that 
Uh, you've been really kind of at the forefront of getting this out to the public. What is the model that you're here to set with the way that you're living your life personally? I do this type of training. You know, I'm a university professor, two kids, working wife. So it provides me a way to fit exercise within my life. Uh, my goal is to fight that aging process as much as I can. You know, I, I'm 48 years old, so you look at the the numbers, and I've probably lived more of my life than I than I have left, and that's uh, quite a scary thought some days. Uh, and so I use exercise to keep my health span up. You know, there's this we all know what lifespan is, but health span is this idea of living the the best possible life that you can for for as long as possible. And I think exercise is the best way to do that. Intervals you can apply them anywhere, body weight style manner any type of cardio and you know that it's a time efficient way to really boost your health uh, and maintain your health uh, over time. Beautiful. Fantastic. I love that. And you just said it yourself, you know, you do this and you've got that life structure that so many people can identify with. And uh, I got to tell you, man, you definitely are a fit teacher. Yes. Right. We yes. could, we could all understand that, that, you know, we want to learn from people who actually have the results. And so uh, with that said, can you let everybody know where they can connect with you online? And also, please let them know where they can find the One Minute Workout. Uh, sure. One Minute Workout, its uh, release date is February 7th, but you can get it from booksellers everywhere. And uh, on my, online, I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, Gabala M. Uh, ramping that up a little bit, trying to participate in this, you know, what we call knowledge translation. For a scientist, you're used to being so cautious. And this this book writing effort has, has really been for me getting out of my comfort zone a little bit. The way that I write scientifically is different from the message in the book. And we've been criticized a little bit for that. Uh, and that's fine. We'll take it. Yeah. But really, this is an effort to try and bridge the science, present it to people in an accessible manner, and hopefully give them some ideas that they can adopt on their own, uh, and all of it, the goal is just getting people to live longer, healthier lives. Exercise is the best medicine. It's a cliche, very few side effects. Uh, and you just think about if more people exercised or engaged in physical activity, the amount of savings that we would have on on all of the, the money that we spend on many different chronic conditions. You know, some of them we can't con uh, prevent at all. Lots of cancers, for example, but a lot of things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease. If we just got people moving a little bit more, uh, that would be good. For, for your personal health and public health as well. Perfect. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you for expanding your horizon for us and pressing past your discomfort. So you're resilient as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I appreciate you so much for uh, doing this work. Yeah. And we all look forward to seeing your book out there and impacting a lot of lives. And I just thank you so much for putting your time and energy into making this for everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show and the opportunity to try and present the message to folks. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. I know that I absolutely enjoyed this. And like I said, this is a phenomenal book. And one of the things he mentioned there at the end is tying in this really kind of uh, dry, like super dry science <laughs> that it could be and making it understandable for everybody because there should not be a barrier exactly. of entry for us to be the best version of ourselves, for Absolutely. us to access the information that can make us as healthy, as fit, and as happy as possible. And that's really what he's done because it, at the beginning, when, and especially when I kind of looked at it, some of his other stuff online, I'm like, yeah, I like this. This is going <laughs> to kind of be geeked out. And then I read the book. It's like, wow, he actually made this all so light and approachable and I know that he actually had to put some work into making that happen right. because he has that tendency to have that pocket protector going on mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, many of us <laughs> do and um, but the, the book is so accessible and also the strategies that are in there we even talk a little bit about um, the different the different strategies for hit training of course but also really diving in and talking about the specific health benefits for your heart health right. for uh, helping to reverse things like insulin uh, insulin resistance we have access to that, those kind of things right there within our own amazing bodies, just utilizing our own amazing bodies. And in that space yeah. right there where we are. So that's what it's really about is becoming more knowledgeable mm. about you. And this is one of those tools we have access to because I truly do believe that our genes expect us to move quickly. All right. Our genes expect us. If you think about historically, would our ancestors just get out and start running just because? Probably not. They probably think it was an extreme waste of energy because <laughs> the next meal isn't always guaranteed. You know, there's a whole system that we've evolved with that today it's a little bit different because we don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from. Like there's food 
everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, but until, so today we're kind of trying to re-engineer or kind of find a way to balance that with our, with our fitness and utilizing the things that our genes expect us to do most, I think can provide more benefit today than ever before, Absolutely. you know? So please take action to utilize this information. Add a little bit of hit into your fitness regimen each week. You know, one day a week is, is more than good. Three is recommended by the good doctor today. Uh, but however you sprinkle it in, make sure that you add it in because you're going to get a lot of benefit. Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Please make sure to share this up with all your friends and family over on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're hanging out. Make sure that you share the love. I appreciate you so much. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon. <laughs>